Good morning. Welcome to Boston, all you early risers who uh, tumbled out of bed in order to learn about uh, imaging inflammation. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, comprehensive inflammation and plaque assessment, uh, raising the bar for CAD management. And it's wonderful that uh, we have assembled, uh, thanks to Caristo, our sponsors here, a uh, really uh, wonderful faculty. I know I'm going to learn from the other speakers. So I'm Peter Libby. I'm local. Um, I walked here from a friend's house. Uh, it took me 16 minutes. And I'm on call, so if my beeper goes off, forgive me, because um, I'm going to have to run up to the hospital after this and, and make rounds. Um, and I'm at Brigham and Women's Hospital in the Harvard Medical School. And I'm going to get things going by giving a little bit of a introduction to the world of inflammation in atherosclerosis. Uh, then uh, Ranak Rajani is going to speak. He's from King's in London, uh, talking about visualizing coronary inflammation with computed tomographic techniques. And he's going to uh, take a uh, balanced view of looking at the strength of the data. And then uh, my colleague, uh, Brittany Weber, also from Brigham and Women's Hospital, you know, I'm sorry, it's a sweet. Uh, we're very proud of Brittany because she's becoming one of the leading exponents of cardio rheumatology, uh, not only locally, but on the national scene and soon on the international scene. She's going to talk about some cases uh, where FAI has uh, proven intriguing. So I think I'll just uh, get things off to a start here. Uh, here are some of the, uh, the potential uh, conflicts of interest. So I'm going to get you started by uh, having you share a glimpse into my world underneath the hood of the atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, these are my competing interests, and I, I would point out that I am a member of the Caristo uh, Scientific Advisory Board, but I do not accept any personal payment uh, from any pharmaceutical or device company, including Caristo. So for, for those who aren't uh, steeped in the basic science, and biology of atherosclerosis, I was asked by the, the Nature Group to uh, honcho putting together this review for people who are not experts in the field. Uh, and I assembled an international group of individuals who are experts in different aspects of this disease to put this together. And here's one of the illustrations. There are many, many versions of this. But the idea is you have risk factors, and we certainly believe that low-density lipoprotein, LDL, is a causal risk factor that uh, perhaps gets modified within the artery wall and can incite an inflammatory response that beckons forth the attachment of our inflammatory cells to adhesion molecules, which are regulated by inflammatory mediators. Um, we, of course, pay a lot of attention to the most numerous inflammatory cell in the plaque, and that would be the mononuclear phagocytes, the monocytes and macrophages, but also the T cells are fewer in number, but they may be sort of like the generals in the army sending the signals, the orders, to the more numerous foot soldiers of the innate immune response, the uh, mononuclear phagocytes. Now, Many tend to view atherosclerosis as an ineluctably progressive process. And in fact, I'd like you to visualize the atherosclerotic plaque as the site of a pitched battle, an ongoing tug of war between uh, forces of good and evil, if you will, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory aspects, and life and death, as shown here. Uh, for many years, we focused on the proliferation of smooth muscle cells. Um, we've learned also that mononuclear phagocytes can replicate in the plaque, but then they can go on to die and form that uh, central necrotic core. And uh, we spend a great deal of time, my own group and many around the world, in working out the mediators and the effects of those mediators that are important in regulating these various processes of proliferation and death, which are ongoing in every atherosclerotic plaque. So again, to convey this concept of the tug of war that's going on, uh, boiling just under the surface of the plaque. Here on the left side, I have a few examples of the alphabet soup in which my inflammatory world lives of mediators that are inciting or promoting or amplifying atherogenesis. And then in blue, on the right side of this slide, you see some of the forces that mitigate 
this inflammatory response. And so it's the net balance over many, many years that gives rise to the wonderful complexity of the atherosclerotic plaque, which we're trying to gauge with different imaging modalities. So from the beginning on the left, through to the final thrombotic complications of this disease that bring the patients to our attention as clinicians most dramatically, inflammation is a constant companion. So we've all focused a great deal on the so-called thin-capped fiber atheroma and plaque rupture, the vulnerable plaque, if you will, as a cause of thrombotic occlusion of coronary arteries. Uh, my laboratory spent probably a quarter of a century uh, providing the data that underlies the schema on this slide. And what this slide summarizes is that when we have inflammation in the intima, as depicted here by the blue adaptive immune cells, the lymphocytes, and the foam cells, the macrophage foam cells, that the T cells can send messages to the smooth muscle cells that manufacture the collagen fibrils that are as strong as steel wires of similar caliber that lend strength to the plaque's fibrous cap and at all that stand between many of our patients and an acute thrombotic complication. Um, so gamma interferon can halt the synthesis of new collagen which is required to repair and maintain that all important fibrous cap. We also spend a great deal of time working out the conversations between the adaptive immune cells and the innate immune cells uh, that regulate both the stability of the collagen fibrils because they secrete enzymes. Many members of the matrix metalloproteinase family that are specialized in breaking down this ordinarily very stable molecule that lends strength to the plaque's cap and also that regulate the thrombogenicity of the lipid core by causing the increase in expression of the potent procoagulant tissue factor, which is the proximate trigger to thrombosis in the ruptured plaque. Well, this is a whole long story, which I'm not going to go into, but we think that the vulnerable plaque, the thin cap fiber atheroma, is becoming less frequent now in an era of much better medical therapy, including the penetration of statins into practice, and that another mechanism of acute coronary syndromes is becoming more prevalent, and that is superficial erosion, that by contemporary OCT studies, optical coherence tomography studies, probably accounts for up to a quarter of acute coronary syndromes. And the fun for me, as an investigator in this field, is that these two causes of thrombosis in atherosclerotic plaques actually were sort of like a, a hand in glove in terms of the pathophysiology and characteristics as depicted here. And in fact, I spent um, decades bashing the macrophage in the plaque, and now studying superficial erosion, I've had to learn about the polymorphonuclear leukocytes, which also undergo a form of cell death that uh, cause extrusion of nuclear DNA. We call it uh, neutrophil extracellular traps. These are a solid state reactor for all kinds of the mediators that are in the granulocyte granules and also pick up from the circulation things like circulating tissue factor and localize them right there at the site of superficial erosion as a sort of a, a surface reactor. Um, so these are little vignettes uh, from work in my group and many others around the world that show that inflammation is a common contributor to atherothrombosis. And the exciting part is that this is now becoming clinically actionable. Uh, we did the CANTOS trial with an anti-IL-1 beta antibody that was the first trial that showed that inflammation can be a target that can reduce recurrent cardiovascular events in the statin era. We now have colchicine in our armamentarium. So, uh, why are we here talking about imaging? It's because we desperately need, in order to fill out that palette of interventions, including anti-inflammatory interventions, a way station to evaluate novel therapies in phase two to inform the design and to green light the phase three outcome trials because even the biggest pharma can't do 
outcome trials that cost upwards of a billion dollars on every drug in their portfolio. So what do we need? We need early stage biomarkers that inform target engagement, dose selection, a very important mode of failure of clinical trials, and efficacy signals so that it can encourage pharma uh, to put down their marker on a particular program. That's really what we're here assembled to talk about. Now, I talked about LDL as a causal risk factor for atherosclerosis, but in terms of inflammation, uh, there are, well, here are just four horsemen that are non-traditional risk factors that can contribute to the inflammatory response, the flame that's burning in the atherosclerotic plaque. And so I'd like to just focus on adipose tissue because we believe that visceral or ectopic adipose tissue can be a hotbed of inflammation. And what are the mechanisms that link inflammation to ectopic fat? Well, there's the lipid overflow hypothesis that because of a combination of environment and genetics that you can overwhelm the capacity of the body to deal with lipid overload. And you get overflow into these ectopic uh, depots, including epicardial fat. So, Adipose tissue is a source of pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is uh, from a review that I did with one of my PhD students, Viviane Rocha, uh, that shows, again, this alphabet soup of mediators that are elaborated by the adipocytes, but also the inflammatory cells that also abound in adipose tissue. Uh, we know that macrophages are important. It was Tony Ferrante at Columbia who first pointed that out, and it's now a growth industry, and also, just like in the plaque and adipose tissue, the orchestra leader, the general of the army, may be the adaptive immune cells, the T cells. This is what Viviani's thesis was about in my group. So ectopic adipose tissue is a hotbed of inflammation, and can we image it? So I'm going to finish my talk with slides that were provided uh, by Charas Antoniadis, uh, who is uh, certainly a principal of our host here, Caristo. And uh, this is his work, so any questions are going to have to go to him. But what they found is that when we take some of those alphabet soup mediators and take um, adipocytes from uh, pericoronary fat, and we see that there's a series, a concerted series of alterations in the functions, it inhibits adipogenesis, induces lipolysis, and gives you these small fat-free adipocytes. So you, when you have an inflammatory environment, you change the character of that epicardial fat. Can you image that? Well, uh, what uh, we'll hear about in this follow-on talks is that when you have inflammation, some of those mediators will attack those adipocytes and cause some of those changes that were shown in vitro on the previous slide, cause them to shrink and change their metabolism, and you get edema, and that can lead to a signal which can be imaged, and that is what we're here to talk about this morning, the uh, fat attenuation index. And as the lesion progresses, we have this crosstalk, this uh, inside-out kind of signaling, which gives us a target for imaging. So uh, this is work, well, we'll hear about that in our next talk. But this slide makes the point that independent of all of these variables that you see uh, in this uh, column here, that the FAI index can actually add to risk prediction. So I'd like to close there. I've had the privilege uh, and pleasure of working with enormously talented people in my own group, and then uh, with also brilliant collaborators um, in our local environment. Uh, these are people who have worked with me here in our system to help push this research work forward. Um, so I think what we will do is maybe, um, I don't have the app up, but we have microphones here. And I think maybe at the end of this uh, symposium, if we have time, because we just have 50 minutes, uh, we'll open the floor for discussion. So I'd like then to move on uh, to the next talk and call on Ronak to uh, talk to us about the uh, robustness of the data that underlies visualizing coronary inflammation in uh, computer tomographic techniques. Thank you very much.
Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation to talk in this symposium by Caristo Diagnostics. And a fantastic uh, talk. Thank you very much, Mr. Libby, uh, Professor Libby. So um, I'm going to be giving a presentation on visualizing coronary inflammation in coronary CT angiography. Nice idea, but is the data robust? And these are my disclosures. So let's first of all look at the science behind carry heart and Christo diagnostics. So I think it's always a good step, first of all, to have a close look inside a human coronary artery. Now here we can see a tuna intercomer layer, which is made up of a monolayer of endothelial cells. Now in this particular example, we can see that there's no atherosclerosis. As we've already heard, vascular signaling promotes plaque development. The activated endothelial layer enables the incorporation of leukocytes through the tunica intima, where these leukocytes develop into macrophages and form, form, and form foam cells, which thereafter causes plaque obstruction into the intracoronary lumen. Now, conventional coronary CT angiography enables us to visual the lumen and structural changes. We can see coronary calcification and plaque as it encroaches on the vessel lumen. However, to date, we have not been able to have a biomarker for silent vascular inflammation. And here is where the PFAI technology really provides us a unique insight into the origins of plaque development. In this example, on the bottom left-hand image, you can see two curved MPRs. And I think all of us would agree that both of these vessels look identical to the human eye. We can see smooth, unobstructed lumens. Now, this is very different to the adipose signaling that's occurring in the perivascular space. On the top left-hand image, you can see preserved um, adipose tissue around the vessel wall. And on the right-hand image, you can see signs of a release of vascular inflammatory cytokines, which have caused a change in the morphology of the adipose layer. You can see adipolysis, and you can see a replacement of the fat cells with water. Now, when we place our adipose fat maps across the vessel wall, we can see on the left-hand side two very different pictures. On the right-hand side, you can see signs of vascular inflammation by perivascular fat attenuation index. Now, this technology, first of all, has been very well scientifically validated. Uh, fat attenuation index is a phenomenon which is uh, reporting the 3D gradients of perivascular adipose tissue attenuation, which is corrected for a number of technical factors. It allows for standardization and also reproducibility. And these FAI cutoffs in Hounsville units can only be used in research in multivariable models. It's affected by technical, anatomical, and biological factors. So certainly the science appears to be robust, and we've seen that from the origins and the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. So what about the data supporting the use of FAI? So in the CRISP-CT study, this was a large study of 2,000 patients from a European cohort and a US cohort of 2,200 consecutive patients. And remarkably, the findings were very similar in these patients who were followed up for 10 years. We can see that those patients who had a higher FAI in the European cohort and also the US cohort portended a worse outcome in total cardiovascular mortality over a 10-year follow-up period. When these two cohorts were combined, certainly the results were consistent. And certainly, abnormal FAI is associated with a six to nine higher risk rate of fatal heart attacks and a five-fold higher risk for fatal non-heart attacks. Now, importantly, this is independent of all conventional cardiovascular risk factors and the degree of coronary artery calcification. Now, the conventional way to look for vulnerable plaques and plaques that are gonna predispose an individual to an acute myocardial infarction is the identification of high-risk plaque features. And all of these will be well known to you. They include the napkin ring sign, low attenuation plaque, and also positive remodeling. So how does this fare against FAI, so fat attenuation index? Now on this dot plot, you can see those patients who have a high FAI and a low FAI, and it compares these patients to those patients with high risk plaque features and no high risk plaque features at all. Now when these are placed on Kaplan-Meier um, survival curves in terms of cardiac mortality, I'd like to draw your attention to the red line and also the yellow line. Now both of these patient cohorts had the presence of high risk plaque features. The only discriminator between these two is those patients with a high FAI and those patients with a low FAI. So certainly there is a very strong signal that fat attenuation index provides greater clarity in predicting those patients who are likely to experience a significant acute coronary syndromic event. So what about FAI in clinical practice? Has it been tested and used in clinical practice and is it clinically valid? 
So the carry heart analysis is already cleared for clinical use in the UK, Europe, and also Australia. Coronary CT angiogram scans are sent over to Caristo Diagnostics, following which FAI maps are generated. The second step is that you get FAI score in normograms, and this incorporates age and gender, along with various technical scan parameters, including the KVP and also the scanner type. This enables biological corrections and vessel-specific calculation algorithms. Once you incorporate your conventional cardiovascular risk factors, such as smoking history, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and also body mass index, and also plaque information, you can be, get, be given a carry heart eight-year risk, which gives you a prediction of that individual's uh, risk of experiencing a fatal myocardial uh, event over an eight-year time frame. So how do we interpret an FAI score? So the technology is fantastic, it's been used clinically, but how do we use this in clinical practice? So the FAI score, the best way to think about this is that it is a standardized measure of inflammation in each coronary artery, which is projected on age and gender specific normograms, which has been cleared for clinical use. So here you can see an accelerometer. And in this particular example, we can see that the patient is on the 17th percentile. And this takes the FAI score of the, of the coronary vessel which has the highest fat attenuation index. These are then positioned on a number of normograms for each coronary vessel, moving from left to right, the left anterior descending artery, the left circumflex artery, and the right coronary artery. And we can see that the patient's individual FAI score is positioned for each of these arteries on these normograms and lies between the 10th and 25th percentile, indicating a favorable profile for this patient and a low coronary inflammatory score. So how does this translate to risk? So if you are on the 50th percentile, this results in a two-fold relative risk increase. On the 75th percentile, a 2.4 relative risk increase. And above the 90th percentile, a three to five-fold relative risk increase. When we compare the FAI score and the carry heart score against patients who are risk stratified based on conventional risk scoring algorithms, we can see about 37% of the population who were scored on conventional risk calculators would be reclassified into a different risk score once the carry heart risk was applied. Now, carry heart technology in the NHS, it is funded in four hospitals in the UK for real world evaluation. Patients see their cardiologists or primary care clinicians and are referred to have a coronary CT angiogram. The DICOM data is thereafter sent to Caristo Diagnostics. We get a visual distribution of the inflammation score by the FAI maps, a quantitative measure of inflammation with the FAI score. We get information about plaque and an absolute risk using the carry heart risk. This data and the report is then fed back to the clinician who can then make an informed a clinical consultation with the patient about their future risk and appropriate management strategies. Now, carry heart technology in the NHS is certainly showing to have a major impact on clinical workflow and decision making. Now, in the first 700 patients that were looked at in the UK, we can see that about 45% of patients resulted in their clinical decision plan being altered once FAI was incorporated into their risk profile. 24% of patients who otherwise would not have been recommended statin therapy were commenced on statin therapy. 13% of those patients already on a statin were recommended an increase in the dose of their statin therapy. And on those patients who were on a maximum tolerated dose of statin therapy, additional treatments were recommended. And these additional treatments are indicated on the right-hand table. Now, certainly the technology is not static. There are a number of ongoing studies which hopefully will prove and validate this technology even further. The current studies evaluating the carry heart analysis are detailed on this slide. We can see that uh, Carista Diagnostics has been awarded an NHS AI award, which is going to be looking at the real world evaluation of the impact on carry heart and clinical decision making with an N of 800. The exciting ORFAN study will look at 250,000 patients from across the globe who've undergone coronary CT scans, and this will be linked to outcome data, thereby making this the largest study ever performed of coronary CT angiography and risk prediction in the world to date. In the NHS, we have a national pilot that aims to transform the chest pain pathway into cardiovascular prevention using the carry heart metrics. Furthermore, there are additional studies which are looking at the mechanistic uh, effects of uh, uh, the sort of coronary inflammation and how this can be reversed with novel treatment algorithms. In the ZU study, which is looking at patients at increased cardiovascular risk, 
So patients who have got established cardiovascular risk factors or chronic kidney disease, patients will undergo a baseline coronary CT scan and a further CT follow-up scan will be performed at approximately 14 months. Now the primary endpoint for this study will be a change in the FAI score. The secondary endpoints will be change in plaque morphology. So certainly we're moving to an era where coronary CT angiography is going to propose a one-stop shop for coronary diagnostics. Our conventional route is certainly to look at the plaque morphology and coronary stenosis evaluation. And this is something that we do in every day of our lives. We now have access to fractional flow reserve or CTFFR to look at the luminal or lesion specific ischemic burden of specific lesions. We also now have advanced algorithms which can automatically summate all of the plaque in a particular coronary vessel and give you an aggregate plaque volume and automatically look at the total non-calcified plaque, calcified plaque and partially calcified plaque in a specific coronary vessel. The holy grail is now to be able to visualize plaque before it develops using vascular inflammatory markers such as the carry heart and FAI scores. And this is certainly going to provide us an unrivaled metric for risk stratification for patients moving forward. The next step certainly will be incorporating further additional parameters uh, from Christo Diagnostics. It's now possible to provide automated plaque uh, composition and quantification in all of these patients having their perivascular fat inflammatory scores. The plaque quantification will enable a total plaque aggregate volume. It will allow the automated luminal detection of stenosis and also enable high-risk plaque features to automatically be reviewed at the same time as plaque inflammatory scores. So to put things in context, which patients will most benefit from a carry heart analysis? So certainly, if you have patient who undergoes a normal coronary CT angiogram, the question that will be answered by the carry heart analysis is treatment required. And this is going to change, uh, require a change in thinking about those people who perform coronary CT angiography and those people involved in primary prevention. If you have an FAI score greater than the 75th percentile, systemic treatment is indicated. If your FAI score is less than the 75th percentile, even in the context of no coronary calcium and no coronary atheroma, then no further treatment is required. Now, if you have a patient who has mild to moderate coronary artery disease, the question that will be answered by the uh, carry heart analysis is how aggressive treatment is required. If your FAI score is greater than the 75th percentile, indicating a high risk, then certainly you should maximize or escalate your treatment. If your FAI score is less than the 75th percentile, you can continue on your current treatment. Now bear in mind, those patients who have zero coronary calcium and have no coronary atheroma at all approximately 17% of those patients are actually at high risk and potentially are falsely reassured by conventional coronary CT interpretation. So how reliable can absolute risk prediction be? I think the journey is still underway. Certainly we hope that the Oxford Risk Factors and Non-Invasive Imaging Study, the ORFAN data set of 250,000 patients from across the globe, extending from the US, Europe, Australia and further afield, will provide us an unrivaled insight as to how this technology can further benefit patients moving forward. So certainly, I think that risk prediction using AI interpretation of CCTA is firmly here. Um, the Christo Diagnostics technology is the only technology at the moment that can look at perivascular fat inflammation as an imaging biomarker as a precursor for atherosclerosis development. So my key takeaway messages from reviewing the literature and also the biology behind plaque development is certainly FAI score has a prognostic value for cardiac death and myocardial infarction. An abnormal FAI score is associated with a six to nine-fold higher risk of fatal heart attacks. CCTA is now becoming a one-stop shop for not only symptom evaluation, but also detecting those patients who are at risk of developing atherosclerosis moving forward. And a comprehensive assessment of cardiovascular disease covering inflammation in plaque is now possible, using plaque characterization to show the extent of disease and the FAI score and carry heart risk as a measure of inflammation and an indicator of disease severity. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And then to uh, bring us home, uh, Brittany, who is uh, a PhD immunologist, so she's uh, uniquely suited for her role as an exponent uh, locally and, and uh, globally of uh, cardiorheumatology, is going to give us some examples, uh, cases of interest from uh, FAI research and CED risk prediction. 
Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much. And thank you for these fascinating lectures by Dr. Libby and Dr. Renaji. And then I'm going to take it home by actually ending with some cases to really have some thought-provoking stimulation of really how we can bring this to the clinic and to our patients to change patient care. Here are my relevant disclosures. And so here is the content outline. So I'm going to go through today on case space. I'm going to go through a, a series of cases on identifying and treating cardiovascular and cardiometabolic risk in prevention cardiology. I'll go through a case in the general population, and then I'm going to uh, steer in the second half of my talk for really what my clinic is focused on, which is cardiorheumatology, where I really think we can learn unique insights from these patients and the underlying inflammatory biology. So we're going to talk about a little bit of how this could be utilized in the young. You just heard a setup for that and how we could potentially use this to guide anti-inflammatory therapy. So these are two different patients I saw in clinic. These are all my patients I saw, I'm going through today. And case number one is a 63-year-old male. He's got a family history of coronary disease, but otherwise he has no hypertension, no hyperlipidemia, and a normal BMI. Case number two, similar age, a 60-year-old female with obesity, hyperlipidemia, and family history of coronary artery disease. So both referred to my clinic, and both patients underwent coronary CT imaging. And what I'm showing you here is very mild diffuse atherosclerosis. Here is the report here that you would get as a clinician. Both of these cases had mild atherosclerotic plaque without significant stenosis. This was a CADS-RAD1. And so for um, both patients, I put both patients on statin therapy, and patient number two was placed into a weight loss program giving the underlying obesity. And these are all for research purposes here, but I want to show you now, I obtained the, the FAI data from them, and what you can see here is that two patients that look very similar, age, low cardiovascular risk factors, their phi score is quite different. You can see here the phi score on the left, the patient is highly inflamed over at the 90th percentile compared to the patient on the right, which has a much lower inflammatory score. So, these patients, although look identical, they could be treated very different. And we are now in 2023, the cardiologists have new tools in our armamentarium, and I really believe this is going to continue to grow. You know, as of just recently, last week or two weeks ago with the FDA, we now have an FDA approved medication that can now be tailored in targeting inflammation with colchicine to further reduce cardiovascular risk in these patients. So then I'm going to transition to the last few minutes of my talk and really talk about my passion, which is cardiorheumatology. And I really believe as cardiologists, we have so much to learn from our rheumatology colleagues. And we are now with increasing complexity. So today in 2023, we don't just have one biologic, we have multiple. And the nuances are really important because certain biologics have certain risk that are different than others. And the biology of the atherosclerotic is different. And so we can see here in this day that we have much complexity to learn from from our colleagues. And I'm gonna go through a case today that I spent a lot of time spending my research on, which is rheumatoid arthritis. And so what do we know about rheumatoid arthritis and cardiovascular disease? So this is a chronic systemic inflammatory disorder. It often affects um, women more than men, and they're usually middle-aged women. We know that these patients are at one and a half fold of increased risk of cardiovascular disease compared to age and sex matched general population. And we believe that this excess risk is attributed to inflammation. So you think about rheumatoid arthritis, as a cardiovascular specialized specialist, we can utilize RA as a human model of inflammation to understand the biology, but we still need methods to identify the high-risk patients. So look on the right, you've heard from the last two lectures about the role of phi. We know from uh, Dr. the last talk that it's associated with a six and nine-fold higher risk of fatal heart attacks. It's more predictive of outcomes compared to the high-risk plaque features, and it can identify those high-risk patients from routine CCTA. And so could this be utilized? in cardiorheumatology patients. And what I love about rheumatoid arthritis is because the biology of the, the, these diseases and what we are continuing to learn from our rheumatology colleagues is these shared mechanistic pathways. This is just a review article that really takes it down to the, the key biology of the arthritis and the joint and where the rheumatologists have been using these key targeted agents that target these key cytokines. And I want to point here a few with the TNF, the IL-1 and the IL-6. IL-6 is a very standard treatment with tocilizumab. 
Now, as we are learning more and more about the, the biology of atherosclerosis, we are now having trials with targeted biologics to IL-6 with Zoltevecumab. So you can see here how beautiful of a model this is. So I'm going to tell you about one of my patients. This was a 64-year-old male. He had rheumatoid arthritis. He was currently on a TNF inhibitor. He was referred to my clinic for CV risk management after he enrolled in a clinical study. His risk factors were underlying rheumatoid arthritis and hypertension. Otherwise, he had, very, he had no other cardiovascular risk factors. He was active. He played pickleball weekly, and he was asymptomatic. He had been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in his 50s, and he's previously on those uh, biologics, as you can see here. And I'm showing you his relevant labs when he saw me in clinic. And so he got referred to my clinic after a clinical a study that I'm participating in demonstrated pretty extensive um, findings here. So what I'm showing you here is the different views, the LAD, the left circumflex, and RCA. But overall, this patient who was asymptomatic who comes to my clinic has very extensive amount of calcified and non-calcified black. Um, with a distal stenosis and pretty severe, um, moderate to severe stenosis in the other territories. And so for research purposes, I've also obtained his FAI. And what you can see here is that this was a highly inflamed patient. He was at the 93rd percentile with a very high cari heart risk score. Somebody who was asymptomatic and who would have never otherwise found this um, found this disease. And so because he had never even presented to um, a, a cardiologist, he was not even on basic therapy. So what did I do that day? Well, I initiated him on a baby aspirin as well as a hydostatin. He had a beautiful response to the statin. His now LDL is now 31. He continues to feel well, playing pickleball with no symptoms. And I've recently added colchicine once daily for further risk prevention. So this just a few highlighting points is that, you know, the role of colchicine in, in, in play here. And I really like to beg the question as you think about this, the future, would this patient actually benefit from switching biologics, potentially to a more targeted biologic, which we now have increasing data that may improve cardiovascular risk with IL-6 and inhibition. So I'd like to transition here to think about how we could use FAI in the young population. These are two different patients I've seen in clinic. They both are young, they're in their 30s, and they both have underlying juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. So these patients have both been exposed to systemic inflammation since their teenage years. When they met me, they were very stable. They had not had flares. They were on standard TNF inhibition. And they both did not have really did not have any cardiovascular risk factors except a family history here and low BMIs. They were highly concerned about their cardiovascular risk and ultimately both of these patients proceeded to coronary CT imaging and I'd like to present these two pieces of data to you and how strikingly different they actually are. So here's case number one, the 33 year old and case number two, the 32 year old. And what I'm showing you here on the patient on the right is he actually had a 40% LAD, non-calcified plaque, when it had been identified, of course, by a calcium score, and the patient on the left had no plaque at all. So you can see here that plaque in a 32-year-old is very abnormal, and so he was initiated on therapy, but case number one, just like you heard in the last lecture, was completely normal. So what I've been continuing to see these patients, I discuss lifestyle modifications, um, reduction, um, uh, diet and control of their RA disease activity. Case number one, no therapies were indicated, but case number two, given the presence of atherosclerosis, he is now on a statin and responded very well to that. Well, let me show you here the FAI I've obtained through the, the research that we're doing. And what you can see here is that actually that patient on the left that had no nothing identified on that coronary CT has a high FAI score, in fact, the 90th percentile. The patient on the right had a much lower phi, much, you know, you can see here his top was in the 66th percentile, thinking through our algorithms. So this really begs the question is, would case number one also benefit from adding a statin or an additional therapy to prevent the further development of atherosclerosis? And so this really brings us down to the key question that we're, t we're talking about today is how can we use PHI to help inform and guide our clinical decision making? I'm just going to end with this uh, pretty complex case, but I think it's a beautiful example of how this can be utilized um, with treatment responses. This is another one of my patients that um, I in 
that became my patient after he enrolled in a clinical study that I'm leading in psoriatic arthritis. 70-year-old male, hypertension and underlying psoriatic arthritis. He was about to begin a biologic and enrolled in a study that we're leading that has both baseline coronary CT imaging as well as cardiac perfusion PET imaging, looking at the microvascular response. His baseline visit demonstrated a very highly abnormal um, CCTA, a CADS-RAD4 with very extensive plaque but without severe stenosis. He had a very um, reassuring PET with just very mild ischemia and a coronary flow reserve of 2.7, which is still within the realm of normal. And then he was referred to the, my clinic after he had these findings. So we intensified his statin and he began an anti-IL-17 as guided by his um, rheumatologist for this disease. And then in six months, I'm showing you his follow-up scans that he obtained as part of the research study. And what you can see here, as though, although the coronary CT has not changed dramatically and one would not expect that the phi scores have dramatically improved. You can see here the CARI heart risk has gone down um, on the right as well as the five scores just looking at the percentiles. And what is beautiful about this case is the cardiac perfusion PET that we also had with it shows an improvement in his coronary flow reserve, showing that the utilization of these two modalities incorporated. So I'm just going to summarize here that we discussed today. I have a phi score being an important novel imaging biomarker that quantifies coronary inflammation and associated cardiovascular risk. It can be made on a routine coronary CTA. It's a dynamic biomarker that changes with treatment. I've shown you that in some of these cases today. And so I really do believe uh, that this could, be an, could, could play an important role in risk stratification in both our conventional patients as well as the unique patients that I also see. So I'm just going to end here with all of my mentors and my collaborators um, and all my funding on the right. And thank you very much. Thanks very much. So I don't have the wonderful uh, app for taking the questions, but would invite people who have questions because uh, we have uh, some minutes for maybe six minutes, according to the, to the clock, uh, for discussion. So invite people to come to the microphones if they have questions or comments and identify themselves. So um, please come to the microphone if you have a question. But uh, Brittany, so you're giving patients in primary prevention colchicine. I don't think that the FDA label um, would sanction that. Certainly neither the Colcott nor the Luda 2 enrolled patients in primary prevention. So it's a bit of a, of a leap of, uh, of faith. Have you encountered any um, unwanted effects of colchicine in your population? Thank you, Dr. Levy. That's, a, that's an excellent question. And um, the, the, the recent label is quite broad when it says underlying atherosclerotic disease. And um, the, the, the one patient that was presented today did have underlying atherosclerotic disease. And so that was the rationale there. And so um, those are the unique cases that I have um, had experience in. Um, in terms of colchicine, I think there's a lot we have to think about. We have to be careful with the dosing of colchicine. We now have the 0.5 milligram dosing um, in the, the, the U.S. that's now been approved, and we have to be very careful about um, when not to use it, which is including renal impairment, hepatic impairment. It's important to also know the key drug-drug interactions, basically the, the azoles, um, clarithromycin, um, and so you have to do ensure the safety of the drug before it's initiated. Yes, back microphone. Please uh, tell us who you are. I'm Madhvi Karyala. I'm a, a cardiac imager. I'm at Tufts Medical Center right here in Boston. Uh, this is a really a fascinating, fascinating uh, discussion, and I just am amazed at what the technology can do. Um, my, my, I have a few thoughts, and um, one is, you know, uh, when you're talking about cardio rheumatology, Specifically, there's a higher incidence in women, and most of the cases that you showed were actually um, in men. So I was curious if you had any early insight into gender differences between the uh, in this in this situation. The second thing also is, um, are there any correlation with inflammatory systemic inflammatory markers? Has that been studied? What what's the current uh, evidence? And again, uh, are we looking at also using this, and are there studies underway to guide precision management based on this? Yeah. Those are all excellent questions, and, I, and, I, and I'll just take the, the first one, that you are completely correct that um, 
Uh, most of these diseases have a higher prevalence in women, uh, psoriasis, psoriasis being the one disease that is about 50-50. Um, I could have easily chosen many female cases, and so these were just the cases that I just choose to highlight today. We do not know the differences um, within these specific populations, the way gender can play, but I think those are an area for active research. Um, and then uh, I think the second question about the correlation of the biomarkers, I'm actually going to pass it back to Johnny, because we do know some of that. Um, I would probably have to defer to the Christo Diagnostics team and the team who have conducted the studies to know whether systemic markers of inflammation are associated with the FAI score, but certainly I think that is independent, so I don't think that when you see uh, a high FAI score it necessarily correlates to a high uh, CRP level, but I'd defer to Harris on that if you want to take that question. Yeah, maybe I can answer this. Um, yes, actually, we have um, a large cohort that uh, we measure CRP. Uh, there is a correlation between uh, high score and high sensitivity CRP. Uh, that, uh, that correlation coefficient is 0 0.1. Highly significant, but uh, low correlation. So it's more or less uh, independent. Uh, and that's because it's a, a very local biomarker, while uh, CRP captures inflammation, mm -hmm. systemic inflammation, that could be from the coronavirus, could be from uh, other, body, uh, other parts of the body. Tell us, do you want to identify yourself in case anyone doesn't know you? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Harris Antoniadis. I'm uh, one of the founders of the company. Yes. Um, Back microphone. <clears throat> Hi, Jeff Goldman, uh, cardiac imager. Uh, very fascinating talks. Uh, I came a little late, so I might have missed the answer to the question. But what, where, where does this stand in the US in terms of well, you know, hey, we're excited, we want to do this, but in terms of FDA approval, when we can use it, and a timeline, any thoughts about where it's going in the U.S.? Again, um, I'd have to put that to Caristo, who are more in line with uh, where they are with regulatory approval. Yes, thank you. So, it's a great question. So uh, my name is Chiang Shirai. I'm also one of the co-founders of Caristo. So I think as Dr. Rajani outlined in, in, in his talk, this is approved in Europe, UK, Australia, and it's undergoing FDA review at the moment. So we hope that next year that the, that the technology should be available in the US and FDA clinic. And actually, one other question was, in, uh, so we have two options when we have a high F FIA score. We have like colchicine, which is kind of aggressive. And you know, we have statins. Do statins affect the FAI score? Because it's, you know, do they affect inflammation? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, there has been, the one advantage of this technology is that the FAI changes dynamically. So it is a dynamic marker of vascular inflammation. And certainly in those patients, particularly who have undergone acute coronary syndrome and have had stenting implanted, when serial CT scans have been performed and they've been commenced on appropriate secondary prevention, you see a fall and a decline in the FAI score. So it's a dynamic marker, so it's very good to monitor progression of disease and vascular inflammation. And I think Brittany showed a lovely case of when, following the initiation of therapy, you saw the FAI score reducing. So very exciting times, I think. Just to answer the question about do statins have an anti-inflammatory effect, the operative question is do they have an anti-inflammatory effect that's independent of LDL lowering and all of the statistical deconvolutions of studies starting actually uh, with the CARE trial uh, through PROVE-IT and many others have shown that indeed it looks like there's an independent effect on inflammation as gauged by high sensitivity CRP that is uh, not related to the LDL. So if you're on a statin, you want to be in the group that lowers both the LDL and the C-reactive protein because they have the best outcomes. The basic science underlying anti-inflammatory effects independent of LDL are very well worked out, uh, which have to do with the induction of transcription factors such as KLF2, cuprolite factor 2, uh, or inhibition of the prenylation of small G proteins such as RAS, RAC, or RO, uh, because on the pathway to cholesterol of distal to the hydroxymethylglutyl coenzyme A, which is the target of statins, are uh, the isoprenoids such as uh, geronyl, geronyl pyrophosphate and farnesyl pyrophosphate that modify the G proteins and their function. So we understand in a laboratory quite well the molecular basis of an anti-inflammatory effect independent of cholesterol. Yes. Uh, Ellen Osnofeld from Lund, Sweden. Thank you very much for very good talks. Uh, quite interesting. Um, 
I was wondering um, about the treatment of these patients, and we do know that there are a lot of biomarkers, of inflammatory bio biomarkers that are related to cardiovascular disease. Some are more cardiospecific. The IL-6, for example, is, is very generic, I think. Um, um, I, I hope you agree on that. Um, and I was wondering, could we have a more specific biomarker where we could actually see that this is cardiospecific treatment, and we are decreasing uh, the cardiovascular risk uh, owing to uh, reducing the FAI uh, and the inflammatory response. That was one question. Well, let, yeah. me, let me deal with that. Um, so the only biomarker which has been studied uh, that informs a change in an in indication uh, that alters outcomes is HSCRP. So we did that in the Jupiter trial where we took people uh, who were in primary prevention, a lot of women in that study, uh, who had a high CRP, but what was uh, at the time uh, level of LDL was no one's guidelines for treatment. We put them on resuvastatin, 20 milligrams or not, 17,000 people. The study was stopped prematurely for overwhelming efficacy. I got goosebumps when I got that telephone call from uh, Sir Rory Collins, was the, uh, not Sir yet, uh, was the head of the DSMB. So the only biomarker that's inflammatory that has been shown to inform a change in therapy that leads to improving outcomes, including total mortality in that study, is HSCRP. Both Dr. Ritker and myself and the group from Rome are totally amazed that after 25 years, we haven't come up with something that's superior to HSCRP, despite thousands of papers about this or that inflammatory marker. Thank you. And the second question is, um, if we have plaque in the patients, uh, whether it's just a cat rats one or if it's uh, above that, I think the treatment is recommended to be the same, isn't it? We have to intensify treatment on all risk right. factors. Right. It's hypertension, it's diabetes, it's obesity, right. it's the rheumatology, it's, uh, it's the LDL as well. Yeah. Uh, and we do know that the adherence of treatment is not very sufficient. We have a lot of studies where it's only 50% after five years. So I was just considering, since we're not even reaching the, the treatment goals that we have today, what is it that the FAI is changing in that consent? I, I think this would be very interesting in those without plaque, <clears throat> without any other risk factors. If we see that there's inflammatory uh, response around the coronaries, then what should we do? Because I think the treatment right now would be the same. Am I absolutely out, of, out in the blue? Well, in, in the NHS cohort, certainly, although the treatment was the same uh, in a proportion of patients, it did alter treatment once you added in the FAI score in about 45% of patients. So it enabled new treatment. It also enabled uh, a recommendation for statin therapy to be up-titrated to a ceiling dose to lower the risk further, and it also enabled the commencement of new medication on top of statin therapy. So I think certainly it does have the potential to change the certain treatment that a patient's being prescribed in about 45% of patients, which is quite significant. In terms of patient adherence, I mean, certainly I've been using the FAI score and the carry heart predi risk prediction tool for probably about 18 months. It's a very powerful message when you show the FIA maps to the patient in conjunction with their coronary stenosis scores and say to them, although you don't have any plaque, you know, you have an opportunity to intervene before you develop plaque and to mitigate your risk moving forward. It's an exceptionally powerful message. Now, certainly, I think that will need to be reinforced with patients. It needs a different type of discussion to the one that us as clinicians have been used to in terms of feeding back the results of calcium scores and coronary CT scans. But I think we're in a new horizon now. Thank you. So, did you have a comment? No. Okay. So, um, I'm afraid that the uh, CCT is going to be vexed with me if I don't wrap up soon because we'll be competing with the other sessions. So, let's take one last question. And uh, certainly, the speakers will be around for a bit if you want to ask personal questions. King Ho from Singapore, Cardiac Imaging. I'm just curious, since this is basically a marker of inflammation, would you expect there to be differences in normal grams or cutoff points of the FAI in different ethnic populations? Yeah. For example, Europeans, right. Americans, and Singaporeans. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. And I think that one of the advantages of such a large data cohort of 250,000 patients that you will certainly be able to have very defined FAI maps and FAI scores for different patient populations, different disease conditions. So I think it's going to be a very rich data set moving forward.
Yeah, what we generally see with uh, these biomarkers of inflammation and ethnicity is that the rank order is preserved, uh, but the absolute values may be different in different populations. So it's a very important consideration and one which uh, should stimulate a great deal more research. All right, well, listen, let me thank our sponsors, Caristo, for bringing us together. This has been great fun for me. I learned from uh, the other speakers. Great questions from the audience. And uh, let me wrap it up uh, with a round of applause for, for our speakers. <laughs>